Hey guys, Youngblood with you, and what I wanted to do today was to really talk about getting back to basics and covering picking the right starter ship. And there's a few reasons to do this again, uh, including the addition of a bunch of new ships, there's changes to ship performance, um, there's new gameplay and locations in the verse, uh, as well as just our citizens starting to see more and more refugees heading our way from Elite Dangerous, and there's really just a lot to cover for those folks. And picking a starter ship is a logical jumping into things point. So with that in mind, I want to quantify how we're going to be breaking this down a little bit. We'll have what I'm going to say are two groups, uh, or tiers really, with various ships in them. But we're not going to just be saying, you know, if you have the money, go buy an Endeavor and that's the best ship for you. Because as a starter ship, one qualification that I'm laying out is that you need to be able to use this ship effectively solo. Even if there are other seats that make it available to be used uh, for other things and it can be done better. Uh, another qualification I will throw in this is that these ships are able to do multiple job types. Uh, for example, a light fighter like the Gladius would not be on this list, for example. Uh, you could pick a ship that can only fight and completely be just fine. But I've already made those recommendations, and they're in the prior video series of picking the right light fighter recommendations. So if that's what you're really into, go check that out. So how we're going to break this down is into two tiers, with the first being your bare minimum entry into the ship, the cheap or entrance into the game, the cheapest options compared. That second tier, though, was really going to be focused on more mid-level starter ships that are either higher performance or higher cost, or maybe both, um, but include some options that will just do a little bit more, and if you're willing to spend the money, great. All of these ships will be uh, at $80 or less, but I will be following up this video with a picking the right multi-purpose ship video that will be addressing some of the pricier options that are still worth your consideration if you're willing to spend that much, along with more specific uh, videos on starting ships of various more specialized professions. If you're thinking, well, I wanna jump in but not wait on your next recommendations in that video, that's fair, but I can tell you that Star Citizen offers upgrades on your ships, so if you want to jump in following this video, that's a good decision to make sure the game is right for you and not spend a lot. And then if you decide that you like it from there, uh, if you like a recommendation that I make later or that you find anywhere really, you can simply upgrade that ship via the ship upgrade tool on the RSI website so you're not losing fonts. Um, I will also call out that I like to standardize the DPS output of ships. So when I start talking about numbers, what I like to do is take the CF laser repeater line and apply that to all hard points um, at the max size to be able to give a consistent DPS evaluation across all the ships. So just note that when you get stock um, you know, ships, they may be vary from what I'm sharing here in numerical perspective, but we're talking about potential. Uh, but in the interest of level setting the playing field, it's what I think is really the easiest way to stay objective. So with all of that out of the way, let's dive into the options. The first tier is going to be looking at ships that are all under $50, which is including the Aurora series, specifically the CL, MR, and LN, along with the Mustang Alpha and Beta, and finally the C8X Pisces. The Aurora models have a design that frankly really isn't for everyone. They look like a spaceship, which is nice, and there is something that's almost nostalgic about it, but there are plenty of people who think it looks like a, pl a flying brick, and from the cockpit there's a lot of struts in your canopy to deal with. The visibility honestly isn't horrible, the interior feels cramped, but when you're in the cockpit, the visibility of just taking in the scenery is noticeably worse than other ships that we're going to discuss. The three variants that I mentioned are all a little bit different, with a CL being more focused on cargo and carrying a larger box, which doubles the capacity of cargo from 6 SCU compared to 3 that comes on the Aurora MR and LN. The LN is more focused on combat, uh, and it gets uh, its si or 4 size 2 missiles instead of 2 size 1 missiles that are on the other two variants. But more importantly, the CL and MR have a limited loadout of four size one weapons, where the LN bumps that up with two size two hardpoints uh, and two size one hardpoints, so you have a higher damage output potential. Granted, the way the balance in the game is at the moment, there isn't much difference in what a size one weapon can do versus a size two weapon, so the overall DPS difference on the combat variant only goes up by 10 DPS, 561 versus 551 that you get on the CL and the MR. That being said, where things sit today isn't a great indicator of where I believe things are likely going to go in the future and what we've seen in the past. 
Um, I think we're going to see difference in damage output on different size weapons spread out again. And when armor comes into the game, the larger guns on the LN are going to be more effective at penetrating holes uh, and more effective than you're going to find on the size ones, which are basically your entry level weapons on the Aurora, MR, and CL. On the interior of the ship, the amenities are pretty sparse, uh, but it does have a bed, which allows you to log out in your ship and save your spot. And once we get into bigger systems where you'd likely need to be, you know, leveraging a slower quantum drive to be more fuel efficient, um, that bed, I think, will be a pretty important addition, even if it's just a nice to have at the moment, uh, because the Stanton system isn't necessarily a great indicator of things that are going to come, like the pyro system, which we know is going to be significantly uh, larger. From a flight model perspective, the CL and MR outperform the LN in their speed, yaw, and pitch values, and we see that the acceleration on the CL is actually the best of the three. Uh, the roll speed on all three of these is the same. Um, all three have identical uh, health pools for their overall HP, which is 6,290, and their body and nose health distribution is identical as well with 1,180 on the body and 1,940 on the nose, and they all have two size one shields. The story I would tell with the Auroras is that they are slow, they aren't agile, and their firepower is okay, but it is definitely a starter ship. It was the original starter ship. Of the three, my preference is the LN. Uh, probably a little bit because I favor combat uh, over other ways to make money, but you do have cargo availability. So you can do cargo missions, you can do combat, you can do box missions and exploring. Um, I also think that the changes to weapons in the future make the two larger weapons you gain on the LN a pretty important value add. And when you consider the LN is actually cheaper than the CL by $5 at $40, and the MR doesn't really win anything, the LN is kind of an easy choice for me, even when you sacrifice some flight performance and cargo to get there. Then we flip over to the Mustangs, which include the Alpha, which is the generalist of the group, and the Beta, which is the explorer camper version of the ship. The Mustang is a cool looking ship, much more sleek than the Aurora. The cockpit experience is frankly amazing, one of my favorite ship views in the game, giving you a near unobstructed view of where you are heading. Um, the Mustangs are significantly faster than the Aurora line, with top speeds on the Alpha reaching 190 SCM and 1159 in cruise, and the Beta coming in at 187 and 1164. The pitch and yaw values are better as well, though not by a lot, but where the real difference comes in is with the roll speed, meaning that you can combine with other vectors and you see a pretty steep performance increase over the Aurora. The durability of the Alpha and Beta is quite a bit better, theoretically, than the Alpha is when you look at the overall health pool being a little bit more than 2,000 points higher, which is not insignificant. The real problem, though, with the Mustang is that it is a bit more fragile and more prone to having pieces blown off of it, and you have um, the limited body-specific section of your ship taking damage and exceeding that specific HP of only 1,200 points which is a very low number overall, you could potentially have a situation where your ship gets destroyed. Also, if you're flying in atmosphere, as you lose those ship parts, you start to sacrifice your flight performance. Uh, the ship does have a smaller cross section and is harder to hit while being faster and more nimble. nimble. Um, so here's where things get a little bit more complicated with the Mustangs though. The Alpha carries a fairly respectable SCU total of four for cargo, while the Beta has none. The Alpha doesn't have a bed to be able to log out in though, but the Beta has a whole living quarters with a bed and other facilities in the rear. I think once exploration becomes more than just kind of sightseeing in the game where we have it today, the conversation is going to change a bit. Um, but since this isn't supported in the game right now, having the variant that succeeds better at in-game tasks such as cargo hauling, box missions, and cargo, uh, I'm sorry, in combat, um, it's just the better choice, and that's the Alpha. Um, and especially in a small system like we're at in Stanton, the lack of a bed is kind of insignificant at the moment. Um, the Alpha also has a 561 DPS, which matches the combat version of the Auroras, the LN, and has a price tag of only $30. So it is the cheapest ship that I'm including on this list, meaning it performs above expectations by a large margin. The final ship on the list for Tier 1 is the one that I was just certain I was going to recommend, and that's the Expedition version of the Pisces, or the C8X. 
This is actually more kind of like a shuttlecraft that comes along with the Carrick. However, it sold on its own and is a very fun and capable ship. It costs $45, so it's one of the more expensive tier one ships. And while it carries four SCU of cargo, it has seats for three people, which is unique to this list, uh, and has two size one missiles, which is something lacking from the Mustang line because there's no missiles on the Mustangs. Um, there are some significant drawbacks though. First off, while every other ship addressed on this you know, tier one list has two size one shields, the Pisces only has one, which is a very significant reduction especially combined with the fact that the whole HP total is only 3,250, it can only sustain half the damage of the Aurora before it gets destroyed. And we already talked about how the Mustang technically has a larger health pool than that, so it's even worse. Um, while the damage output from the weapons isn't bad, the flight performance isn't great compared to the other ships already mentioned. So what you have is a fun and capable ship albeit just more limited than the others on the list, especially when you look at the return on the investment, which makes it really just kind of impossible to recommend the C8X, um, other than it just does things well, but if you want to do everything, it's just not the right, it's not really the right option. So to summarize tier one ships, I would say that the two front runners for me are the Aurora LN and the Mustang Alpha. Now, if you find that a bed is mandatory for you, then I think the LN is the best for you by default. Now, I would caution that I don't think it's mandatory in the current state of the game, and chances are, if you buy one of these, you're probably going to end up upgrading into something else eventually, but if it's important to you, it's important, and the Alpha doesn't offer that, so the LN gets the recommendation in that category. I would also say that if you're planning on doing a lot of NPC bounties to make money, and if you're not a great shot, and, or just really just enjoy using missiles, the lack of missiles on the Alpha means that by default, again, the LN is your recommendation. Aside from those two callouts though, the Alpha is better suited for combat, cargo, and has the cheapest price at only $30. The flight model is the best of these ships by far, so it's more fun to fly as well, and if you enjoy flying it, you're more likely to use it. You do need to watch the damage that you take when you're in combat because, as I mentioned, there are some weak areas on the body of the ship, but overall the return on your investment with the Alpha is frankly unmatched on this list and gets the overall Tier 1 recommendation, which to me was a little bit of a surprise as I sat down and did this video. As we move on to Tier 2, this is going to include the 100 series, the Avenger Titan, the 300 series, the Reliant Core Antana, and the Nomad. So it's a bigger list to tackle. Basically, these are all ships that have an ability to carry cargo, can do more than one singular focused activity, and have a price tag at $80 or less. Starting with the cheapest of the line is the 100 series, which is the three ships that are all from the Origin Luxury line and are basically their version of starter ships. They're nice flying little ships that have decent interiors and pleasing exterior designs. Um, the three different versions include the 100i, which is the generalist of the group and costs 50 bucks, followed by the 125a, which is the more combat-focused variant at $60, and finally the 135c, which is the cargo-dedicated version at 65 bucks. From a durability perspective, they're all the same, which have a pretty limited 44 or 50 uh, for overall HP, and 2200 dedicated to the body. A nice point is that they currently don't have a nose HP, meaning that you don't have that traditionally weaker section of the ship called out, but that may just be because the physicalized systems that are going to be used are in their infancy, and the low HP of the ship overall means they can't really make that section any weaker without making the ship unusable at the moment. The biggest problem with these ships is that in conjunction with the low HP, they're also the only ones in this tier two grouping that have only one size one shield, meaning that much like the Pisces that we talked about, you don't really have a lot of protection before your hull starts taking damage. And then that doesn't really hold up all that long either. So it's just not a very durable ship. On the flip side though, looking at a damage output, they all share the same hard point sizes, which is two size three hard points, giving it a total DPS on repeaters being 458 for all three of the variants, including the cargo variant or the combat variant. Things are a little better for the 125A, which comes with six size two missiles compared to two size two on the 100 and the 135. But with only gaining four missiles to make something a combat variant, it's not a real large value add. Uh, looking at the flight model, the acceleration values are better on the 100 and the 125 than they are on the 135 cargo version. 
but the 135 is also the best in terms of yaw, pitch, and roll. So as long as you're okay with you know having more maneuverability than acceleration, and they do play off of each other, they all fly relatively similar enough to kind of call it a wash. The biggest difference in these ships is the cargo hauling potential, and the 135C wins by a lot by carrying six SCU of cargo compared to the two on the 100I and the 125A. Two SCU of cargo is technically enough to be able to make money, but it's gonna take a long time, and when you consider that the 100i isn't really better at combat, and the 125 doesn't really offer you a lot more in that category either, um, especially if you're proficient at combat without missiles, the 135C is the best variant of the group by far. Granted, none of these are really options that I would recommend to pick for a tier two starter ship, mostly just because they're limited and the price jump to the 300 series, which frankly just does a lot more, isn't that significant. Speaking of the 300 series, though, much like the 100 series from Origin, the 300 series from Origin follows similar naming conventions, with the 300i being the Generalist at $60, bucks, the 315p being the Explorer at $65, and then you've got the 325a being the Combat Specialist at $70. Bucks. There is technically a fourth model on the 300 series, which is the 350r, which is the racing version, um, but at $125, bucks, we're not including it on this list. So... Let's start by comparing the cargo, which is 8 SCU on the 300i and an impressive uh, 14 for the 315p and only 4 SCU for the 325a. Uh, damage in the hull points are identical between the three um, with 9,650 for the overall HP, uh, which is more uh, double than what the 100 series brings and combined with two size one shields, it also is providing double shielding than the 100 series, uh, which all really just says that the 300 is significantly a better protected ship other than its you know, younger 100 series ship. Uh, the 300 and the 315 uh, have three size three hard points. So looking at repeaters for standardization, you get 540 DPS, but the more combat oriented 325 has a size four hard point on the nose. So the DPS climbs by 11 points with repeater, so 551. Remember, though, that while the number isn't that significant of an increase, eventually these numbers will change and it will be a bigger deal in the future, in addition to the armor penetration options of the larger rounds. So in the future, that size 4 hard point will be a big difference. Or if you just kind of have a hard time with aiming, you could just drop down, keep the same DPS, but use a gimbal on the nose, and now all of a sudden you have a, a gun that will track targets and help you with your aiming. The other consideration here is that the capacitors that determine how many rounds on laser weapons that you have before requiring a recharge are dependent on the hard point size. So that size 4 hard point could be swapped for a size 3 weapon, and if you decide to do that, you can fire it for longer on that hard point without recharging, meaning that the DPS climbs over time, and that's important in its own right. All the ships basically have the same acceleration values between them, and the speeds are all similar enough, with the 315 technically having the lowest top speed and the 325 being better at chasing down targets or evading threats, um, with a pretty good top speed in cruise at 1,234 meters per second. Agility on these in regards to yaw, pitch, and roll values are all similar enough to compete with each other, but as far as this list is concerned, the 325 is probably the best bet of the ships from a balance of damage output to ship flight model, which when you combine that with the 4 SEU of cargo, it's a pretty worthwhile competitor and my recommendation out of the 300 series ships. It also has the best missile loadout, which I don't value a lot, but it does have two size two missiles combined with four size three missiles, which helps it punch up a bit and is one of the few ships on this list that actually comes with size three missiles. Then we move on to the Avenger line. It technically has several variants, being the Avenger Stalker, uh, which is the bounty hunting variant that has the holding cells, but it is unable to carry cargo boxes. And then you have the Warlock, which is the EMP version and also can't carry cargo boxes for commodity trading. So while they both have their own value and their own prices, um, they aren't, they're both more expensive and they don't really qualify as starting ships in my mind from a cost perspective to some degree, but more importantly because they can't carry the cargo, which I think is important. So we're going to by default look at the Avenger Titan model, which costs only $55 and is the most generalized version of this ship. 
Now, if you heard about those other variants and thought, man, like the holding cells seem really cool. And if you think that, and you're probably in luck because we're operating under the assumption that we're going to be able to get customization in the ship later and the ability to swap out cargo space for those holding cells if you prefer that. Uh, much like if you bought the most expensive, uh, the more expensive stalker uh, and opted out of those cargo cells for cargo or those holding cells for cargo space. Granted, that's not in game to confirm that yet, but it should be the way that things pan out based on what CIG has said. If you want to add the EMP, however, that's less likely to show up as an option because the in, that involves additional weapons connectivity that isn't in the other models. But again, for the sake of the starter ship, cargo is a requirement and a lower price is a real benefit, so the $55 Titan is a mainstay on my recommendations list. From a durability perspective, the Titan has a whole HP of 11,900, which is just second to the Reliant line as top of the list. And looking at the cross section, which equates to difficulty to hit, it is bigger than the 100 series, but smaller than the 300 series in the Nomad and the Reliant. The durability of the body and the nose sections are 2,500 respectively, which isn't great, um, which means you need to watch the damage that you're taking and where it's actually being landed but the numbers are better than the 100 and 300 series there as well. The eight SCU of cargo it brings along is only beaten by the 315 and matches the 300i, both of which get beaten out by my recommendation by the 325. And then you also have the Nomad, which can carry more cargo, uh, which we will eventually talk about. So the value of the cargo that you can add in the Titan is a major perk for a ship of this price and this versatility. Weapons-wise, you match the 325A, which is two size three hard points and one size four hard point, giving you a repeater DPS of 551. You have four size two missiles, which is about average for the list. But again, I don't put a lot of value in the missiles because they're easy to burn through and they can be a crutch for players. The flight model shows that this ship is slower than the 100 and the 300 series in cruise, but faster than the 100 series uh, with a top speed while falling behind the 300 series in that category. Agility between the best flying 300 series ship, the 325 and the Titan, are very similar with yaw favoring the 325, pitch favoring the Titan, and they equal each other in the roll category. The Avenger also has a cockpit entry ladder as well as a ramp at the rear, meaning that you have an option on how you enter and exit the ship. In addition to having a bed, meaning that overall the Titan is a hell of a ship for the price and the ROI on my mind is basically unprecedented. Beyond that, we get into the Reliance. There are technically four variants of the here. You've got the Corey base model, the Tana combat model, the Sen research model, and the Mako, which is kind of a news van, very niche case, doesn't apply to this list whatsoever. Overall, only two of them really hit the true nature of a starter ship, which in my mind are going to be the Corey and the Tana. The Tana, if you really want to focus on fighting, is going to be your best bet. It has the target's missile, pay, the, it's just the biggest missile by, by far. It's got 20 size 2 missiles, which is frankly incredible for this list. Here's the weird thing, though, especially about the Reliance. They have different turret options based on the model that you buy, and the turrets are pilot-controlled weapons, meaning that you can actually out-DPS the combat version in the Core starter version if you don't change the hard points on your Tana, which are actually available also to be able to buy on different versions if you go out in the verse and find them. But what that basically means is that from a guns only perspective, if you opt to use the Toshima turrets that come with the Core on the Tana, you can match the max DPS output by using smaller weapons while retaining the missile payload of the Tana, making it a far fiercer ship. Um, again, here's where things get interesting. The Core has six SCU of cargo, while the Tana only has one. And in my mind, one SCU of cargo isn't really worth enough to consider this a true starter ship because of the value of what you will sell is so low and the time that you spend traveling to make that sale is just not going to get a return that's worth your time and it doesn't make any sense on, at all at that value. On the flip side, the Corey carries six SCU of cargo, which is admirable, but it doesn't have a bed that you get on the Tana. The Reliance have another really very major problem though, which is that they don't fly real well. They're slow, they have a gigantic body to hit, so despite having a pretty great DPS output, at least compared to this list, and decent cargo or missiles depending on the option that you choose, the Reliance are just 
in a pretty bad place in general. But as a starter ship that you you know want to be able to do multiple things in, the Corey is really the only one to be able to consider. And in my mind, that thing is drastically outclassed by other options on this list. I'm a well-known Reliant hater. So you need to take all this with a grain of salt. But it's not like it's just me being a hater because I don't like the way the ship looks. I would challenge that anybody that says, like, you're a hater, this isn't a fair evaluation by saying that when was the last time you saw another player using a Reliant recently? And that answer would be almost never. You just don't see them. And I think actions speak louder than words in a game where min-max is super prevalent. And those choices, especially in a PvP environment, are representative of the functionality of ships in the game. The last ship on the list is the Consolidated Outlands Nomad, which is the most expensive ship on this list at $80. The Nomad is kind of like the Mustang Beta on steroids. It's a ship that looks like a stink bug, or if you're familiar with Elite Dangerous, if you're one of the refugees, it looks a lot like an asp. Um, it's a unique little thing that has hover pads. It's got this weird like truck bed uh, and a nice uh, interior living quarters that's really just unmatched by other ships on the list. The flight model is frankly probably worst on the list with an SCM speed that's only better than the Reliance, but a top cruise speed that's only beaten by the 300 and 325. The maneuverability is the worst of the group by a good margin. Um, but what you sacrifice for that though is... Um, what you end up getting by that sacrifice is having the largest by a big mark in the cargo hauling ability at 24 SCU, which is 10 more than the 315P, and double the other recommendations, making it the best earner from a cargo ability perspective. DPS from a bounty hunting perspective is 520, which isn't great, but it's not really all that far off from the others that we've considered best in class. And most importantly is the associated durability, which makes the Nomad unique now that the Sabre, which is a light fighter, um, has lost, is the only ship that has three size one shields, which is a huge value add. Hold durability does fall behind the Reliant line a little bit, um, and the Titan as well. But the HP values per part of the ship are best in class. So you have to worry about less of where you're taking damage across the ship and just really focus on how much damage you're taking overall. Um, the Nomad also is one of the better missile loadouts with eight size twos uh, to be able to help with engagements. The unique thing about the Nomad though is that it's the only ship of the group that has the ability to haul a Grey Cat Rock mining buggy. Uh, and what that means is that you now have a consistent way to make money and nothing else on this list actually fits that. It's a little bit wonky, it's a little bit inconsistent, but you can get it in there, which means that you can do cargo, combat, mining, box issues, and exploring, which makes this the most well-rounded ship in the category, and honestly, it's not up for debate. So when we get down to the overall Tier 2 recommendations, I really look at two ships depending on the type of gameplay you favor. If you want to do several things, but you think combat is your preferred approach, then I think you're down to that 325A versus the Avenger Titan discussion. Between these ships, I opt for the Titan, mostly because it's cheaper by 15 bucks, meaning you can CCU to the 325 later if you decide to do that. But in addition to that, you carry double the cargo, the hard points are identical, you have more whole HP, which equates to greater durability, and in addition to a smaller cross-section, which means you're harder to hit um, with the ships that share similar flight characteristics, um, overall, it just feels like a better value. And, and in my mind, it's the best bang for buck ship in the game. And that's the Avenger Titan, which is something that I've recommended time and time again and will probably continue to do so because it makes all the sense in the world until it doesn't. The other call out is the Nomad though. Um, this ship triples the cargo ability of the Titan, gives the best shields by a long shot, adding the third size one, has competitive enough DPS to be able to do PvE bounty missions, not real good at PvP, has a decent missile loadout, can carry a rock which opens up a new gameplay in mining that the other ships can't offer, and has a living quarters that the others can't really match. I am actually a huge fan of the Nomad because it is so well designed and it just does a lot for the owner. That being said, again, as I mentioned, if you want to get into player versus player fire fighting, the Nomad is easy pickings based on the flight model and the size of the ship. And while the Avenger is close enough to be able to compete with some of the more dedicated fighters, 
um, it, it is a much better ship between these. So if PvP is an arena that you want to get into, then again, I would focus on the Titan. But if overall versatility is your preference, then I would say the Nomad is the way to go into the game. I also want to note that this video is a recommendation on current price to buy since you need to be able to get into the game. This is not a reflection of the way that chips are priced in game because that will change over time and those prices are going to you know jump all over the place drastically. Other videos I put out um, are really going to be considering in game cost, but I'm talking about the fact that you need to be able to buy a ship that gets you into the game. And in my mind, to summarize the recommendations, if you want the cheapest way into the game with the best option, that's going to be the Mustang Alpha. If you want a ship that offers more that can compete with the other much better ships, the Titan is that best option. And finally, if you want a ship that offers what nothing else on this list can do, but sacrificing you know the best combat ability, then the Nomad is where you should look. So I hope that helps you guys. That's kind of your entry into the game. It covers a lot. We spent a lot of time on it. There's going to be a lot more content coming soon. If you have questions, please get them into the comments. Myself or the community will answer them on your behalf. Uh, if there's other these types of videos you're interested in seeing, please share uh, your uh, thoughts below. Otherwise, I appreciate you guys watching. Have yourselves a wonderful day. Stay tuned for more coming soon and take care.